to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Tracy, you know, we did a recent episode on rent and whether the price of rent is ever going to go down. And I asked the question, like, why don't they ever build new apartment <laughs> buildings for families? Totally unself-interested question. <laughs> from now, from here on out, now that our uh, years of just doing supply chain episodes are <laughs> going to come to an end, let's just do episodes about our own personal growth. Our own about personal the, frustrations. The state of the economy. All right. Uh, where are all the dog amenities for apartments? That's, That's my question. Thing. That's the thing. Like, there's plenty of buildings with dog amenities. And as a, you know, I have uh, two kids and sometimes we look at like new apartments and they're like, I want like a building with dog amenities and billiard rooms and gyms and doormen and all that stuff. But they don't make those buildings for like the actual units. And my kids don't play pool. (laughs) <laughs> well, you got to teach them. Yeah. No, but I, I think you're right. It seems like a lot of apartment buildings are geared towards young professionals yes. for the most part. It's studios. It's one bedrooms. Here in New York, it yes. tends to be larger apartments that have been cut up at one point in time. And you end up with these really weird floor plans where like the bathroom is right next to the kitchen. Yeah. And uh, it's it's not a very pleasant experience for anyone. But I think there is there is this overarching question of why are these decisions being made in the way that they're being made? Right. Like there must be some reason. And the people who are building these buildings, you know, obviously they have, you know, presumably some good business reasons, but I don't know what they are. And I find it frustrating. And I guess I'd like it to change, but I don't know, like if any like developers are going to like change their business models. For well, me. I think the expectation is like, I just got to move out to the suburbs. And my kids are really tired of sharing a bunk bed. <laughs> okay. What I will <laughs> say also is I think this is a peculiarly American problem yeah. because having lived in many other places, apartments are well designed. Even in Hong Kong, where the average size of apartments tends to be incredibly small, they are designed for that tiny square footage. And so they tend to be quite functional, even for families. And certainly in Europe, there's much more of a culture of renting versus yeah. ownership so that you do have families who spend, you know, decades in the same apartment building. I think you're Totally right. Here, the basic idea is that if you live in the city in an apartment, you're young, you're single. And then if you have kids at some point, then you move out to the suburbs and the housing stock is not made for people who would say like to stay in the city and maybe be a renter in one unit or one building for 20 years. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. All right. So what explains the state of affairs? Is there any reason to change it? We're going to be speaking to two guests. I think they were both heard our last episode and then spent a couple of days sort of debating it on Twitter. And so it's like, well, why debate on Twitter when you can come in? So yeah, we are going come to, talk to us. Yeah, just come talk, talk to us rather than uh, wasting it all in tweets. We are going to be speaking with uh, Stephen Smith. He is the executive director at the Center for Building in North America, a think tank around construction policy. We're also going to be speaking with Bobby Fion. He is a real estate developer and he knows all about apartment floor plans and the thinking behind the, the business reasons behind these decisions. So, uh, Bobby and Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Very glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, Stephen, I'll start with you, but really, are we right? Like, let's let's start with, is the premise that we're talking about, that a lot of these new developments really aren't geared towards families, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, the uh, typical new apartment building in the United States, the developer will try to cram in as many studios and one-bedrooms as they can. You know, I think it's mostly driven by policy. You have a lot of there's a lot of planning policy that tries to encourage more family sized units, but they're really pushing against some more uh, fundamental uh, regulations that make it quite difficult to build family sized apartments in any sort of affordable way in uh, not just the U.S. but also Canada, North America. Stephen, can I ask a quick follow up before we bring in Bobby? But why does it matter? Do we need to have families in in apartments? Why can't everyone just move out to the suburbs? I mean, that you know, that's the that's a safety valve. Is you know, in America, you can just move out to the suburbs, and we make it quite easy to build family sized houses. So, I mean, you know, does it matter? I, I guess you know, if you want our cities to thrive, if you want you know people to be able to raise families in them, you know, for environmental reasons. Uh, or you know, even for some social reasons, yeah, I, I would say it matters. I don't want to live in. Uh, I don't want to live in the suburbs. <laughs> I don't either. I like living in Manhattan. I don't want Joe to have to live in the suburbs. More importantly, <laughs> thank you, 
Thank you for recognizing that. All right, Bobby, all right, let's uh, bring you in. So you come from it from the business perspective. What is like the sort of like big picture math in your view of someone builds a new apartment, they have an opportunity, they get the approvals to put down apartments on a plot of land. Why is it better to target young professionals and the types that don't need that space for children? Well, it is simple math in that smaller units generate higher rent per square foot. And that is the primary driver of returns for ground up apartments in the way that we finance them here in the United States, which is, you know, through private market capitalism, unlike other parts of the world. So in those places, Mm. someone will look at the building in their spreadsheet and they'll look at other comps in the market. And the primary way that they compare units to other units is they say, here's the rent, here's the size, here's the number of bedrooms. I want to try and make it slightly smaller. So like, it's, it's like the power of a diminishing marginal returns like in reverse, right? A 599 square foot one bedroom will get basically the same rent as 600 square feet. So that dynamic ends up pushing all units to being smaller. That's the basic math for why uh, real estate developers are incentivized to try and put as many of those types of units they can into the building as possible. There's a host of other things that I'd say have to do with the different timeline of incentives, but that's the Hmm. largest driver. So walk us through as a real estate developer, you know, when you are considering a potential investment or a potential new project, what are the things on your spreadsheet that you're looking at? How are you making those calculations? Well, I like to think that I make them a little bit differently than other people, but I would say in general, what I and other people are looking at is the the trends in the market to see which unit types are getting the highest rents. Those obviously are going to be within the class A new construction uh, sub-market. So you're not going to compare yourself to um, a pre-war building unless it's been heavily upgraded. And, well, I'd say it really is ends up being that simple. If, if there's a large problem that we have within real estate, which I hope to like advance um, in the future, and I hope like our industry advances, it's that the real estate data is very simplistic. Rents are extremely opaque, and things get, I'd say, reduced down to different unit types. There's a lot of different, I'd say, like data on new housing inventory that gets added to individual markets, and that's almost never broken down into type. And even when it's hmm. broken down into type, it's definitely never broken down into is this three-bedroom, four families, or is it essentially three one-bedroom suites? Those kinds of nuances are always lost in data. Yeah, that's something that came up in our, kind of in our last episode on rent, which is that, you know, we talk about like multifamily, et cetera, but like, it's kind of meaningless. What city are they in? How many, you know, whatever it is, like that sort of drill down is like, you know, these are, it's not all fungible, it's not all the same. I just realized we should probably talk about what we mean by apartments meant for families. Like what exactly is it that families would like to see here? I mean, I I would say fundamentally what families want is a lot of bedrooms. And, you know, Joe, like when you think about like, (laughs) what would you like? You'd probably like most of all, you'd like just one extra bedroom. You don't need an extra walk-in closet. You probably don't need an extra bathroom. You just want one extra bedroom. So fundamentally, I think, you know, a family-sized apartment might be a three bedroom, one and a half bath, maybe a three bedroom, two bath. But the second and third bedrooms, they don't need walk-in closets. They don't need ensuite bathrooms. And that's what you get in the US. And that's maybe it's not by design, but it is in some sense mandatory based on the building and zoning codes. I think uh, we should have this. It should really just be Tracy hosting this. And I should just be like the third guest since I have all these complaints. <laughs> but clearly, Stephen, like you must view this question somewhat differently than Bobby to identify zoning and codes as being a driver rather than the simple unit math. Yeah. I mean, I I would say in the United States to add an X, you know, let's say, let's imagine your typical new construction uh, apartment. There's a long, you know, hallway in the middle of the building and then perpendicularly arrayed off of it, there's apartments and you enter one of the apartments. And if it's a two bedroom apartment, it's designed in what someone once called a a bowling alley configuration. So you enter it, you enter in the kitchen, you're about, I don't know, 30 feet from the window, probably. And there's not actually a whole lot of window space in the apartment. And it's, you know, 30 feet away from you. So on the left, you have a bedroom. So, you know, you enter in the kitchen, and then you go 
then you go forward and then you see like a living area. And then on the left, you have a bedroom. On the right, you have a bedroom. And those are by the window. But what do you fill all that other space with? There, there's a ton of this space that would not exist in, in Europe or in Asia, mostly, because the building is much, much thicker than it would be in another country. So, you know, when we think about what a family wants, they want another bedroom. And a bedroom, typically, you know, by codes and customs, has to have a, a window. So, you know, you want to capture that extra window space, but then you need to fill all this space, at least in the United States. And, you know, this is square footage. It costs money to build. It costs money to maintain. You have to fill it with something. You're probably going to fill it with, you know, bathrooms, which are, you know, if anyone's ever done a home renovation, they're the most expensive part. Huh. So in the United States, when you add an extra bedroom to a two-bedroom apartment or a one-bedroom apartment, you typically have to build, you know, just within the apartment, about 300 square feet of extra space. The bedroom itself is only about, you know, 10 by 10, 100 square feet. But then you need to, you know, fill all that space in the middle. Whereas in other countries, in Europe, Latin America, or Asia, to add the extra bedroom, you might need an extra, I mean, in some cases, you can just add an extra 100 square feet, but maybe you'll add an ex- another, you know, 150, 200, but you're adding much less space to add that bedroom. So, you know, buildings cost money based on the rent per square foot. But when you rent an apartment or buy an apartment, you're probably not looking at it based on a, you, you know, you're not looking for a number of square footage, you're looking for a number of bedrooms. Bobby, you mentioned the lack of floor plan data. What do you mean by that exactly? Mm. Because when I think of floor plans, I think that's like the one thing that is potentially available and kind of standardized across every apartment building in America, certainly. Oh, Tracy, where to begin <laughs> answering that this question? Is this is naively. Um, you scratched an edge. Uh, yes. So I'd say this is uh, the... That question has been driving me in my career, I'd say, for the last like seven years and bothering me. I'd say in in looking at my own Excel models, like when I've built ground up apartments, it always intensely bothered me that in Excel, there was no differentiation between square footage. It's always a multiplier, like a base rent per square foot multiplier, depending on type, right? It's just like a little pivot table. If it's, if one bedroom multiply by four square, four dollars a square foot, if two bedroom multiply by usually less 350, right? right? And there's no differentiation between those two. So I'd say that is something that has bothered me for a while, given that anyone who walks into a unit knows that there are 700 square foot one bedrooms that are great and 700 square foot one bedrooms that are a piece of junk, right? But it has to be captured like in data somehow or else. Oh, I uh, see. It's like the qualitative do- difference. I would say, yes, qualitative, but like you have to use some sort of data analytics or or some sort of data columns just to say, well, how large is it? Again, similar things like we all know that height matters. Mm. Height should increase rent, but what would be the only way to prove that? Mm. Well, you would have to go through and measure the height of every place, then equalize for all other like uh, real estate type attributes and then say, aha, now we know that height matters by this much. Mm. When in fact, every person knows that to be true. We just don't know exactly how that's true. So I would say that the difficulty on that has been driving my, me and my career for a while. It's why I left a real estate development for a little while to start two different sort of technology ventures. And now I'm in, like, uh, I'd say the software data business around floor plan well, data. I was just about to ask, could you create an algorithm that takes in like data inputs and then tries to spit out, I I don't know, like a livability score? Well, I was just going to say, you know, Bobby, in your Twitter bio, you have quotes. I don't know who made this quote. Maybe you even made it up. Uh, Bill James of apartments. Bill James, of course, being the Moneyball guy who famously took baseball and tried to get it (laughs) out of pure sort of like subjective, like, yeah, that guy, that guy has good hustle and tried to put numerical, you know, really quantify the speed that someone could go or how all these other things. So how do you go about sort of like taking these things that seem subjective? Yeah, this seems like good. That's nice and airy. It's roomy and try to put some like hard math behind. Uh, so that is a self that, that is a self chosen moniker, oh. and it is um, it it is an homage to I think like the mathematical approach, and it is also meant to me to be a reminder of how long it takes to do that. If for those people who remember the yeah. story of Bill James, he was doing this by manually 
calculating things from box scores that he got in newspapers 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. And it took at least 25 years for the general approach to move forward. And the other thing that I also greatly admire about that approach is that none of his particular algorithms are that meaningful or that, that good anymore. But it was the approach of saying, uh, we are going to go through and turn the sweet science into something slightly analytical. So for me, how that works in floor plans is, as you mentioned, Tracy, there are a tremendous number of floor plans. Every apartment has one. The dimensions on them are nearly always useless because it's not always clear whether it's pointing to a wall or whether it ends in the middle of the room. Sometimes the dimensions are just incorrect. Sometimes they've taken room names and changed them from something useful to something useless, like from bedroom to dream. Um, and some other the grand uh, room, yeah, like some, some other ridiculous yeah. things, which so which confuses people. But my basic approach has been to build some software tools to take essentially these low resolution image files and turn them into a lot more usable pieces of data. So instead of a room or a unit being described as a 775 square foot one bedroom, it would be described as there is a room that has dimensions X and Y. It may or may not have a living room. It may or may not have direct access to a bathroom. And it has a closet with linear feet hanging of Z. And by breaking things down into some more pieces, then you can do some of the fairly straightforward statistical analysis on, on apartments to say, in an area, do people want like a kitchen that's 14 feet or are they okay with 11? Does someone prefer that extra foot in their bedroom? or in their living room, given like a fixed space. So I'd say that's where it, it initially started. The family-oriented aspect of those apartments kind of came out of the data and saying, there are a lot of apartments, and many of them are not being built to these sorts of specifications. Mm. Stephen touched on some of them, which is that the size of closets in the United States is at least two to three times what is in Europe. And I'm not they're I'm huge. not an expert in Europe, but they're, they're huge. <laughs> in Europe, we still use wardrobes. Yes. Like a piece of furniture that acts like yeah, a yeah. I, I, Joe's looking at No, me no, like, we, I had one of those. Okay, in, I okay. had a studio, it was, or I had a loft in the financial district right. for a while. So, so you there have was a no, rail that you and like so hang there was your just like, on. we just bought this like huge sort of, yeah, wardrobe from Ikea that stood like next to our TV, basically. I mean, Stephen is absolutely right that our building form does drive a lot of this stuff, right? So the general process for real estate development is that a developer is going to go identify a piece of land, and then first say, go to the city and say, I would like to build this approximate footprint with this many units, this many parking spaces, this amount of like mixed use. It isn't until after the building is approved that then they'll go through and configure units because you're not going to spend money on full architecture right. when you don't know the general layout. So once the building footprint is defined, mm. then it's a matter of how do you shift around walls? How do you chop up that space into a unit mix and type maximizes your returns. And that's why almost always small ends up like driving, small and deep ends up like really mm. pushing things forward. And once the building is set at being like 65 feet wide in the long direction, well, now we know in simple math, like your units are going to be about 30 feet deep. Mm. Well, then that means your smallest studio can be 450 feet, a two bedroom Wait, what you need mean? to be. What? What, do you, what does deep mean? Deep. Thirty feet deep. So um, the difference, the, the the distance between one window to, to the other window on the other side of the oh, building. Oh, so I you're see. looking at it from the street. How far back does the whole apartment go? And it goes in the United States. It typically starts at about sixty five feet. I would say, right? Got it. Uh, well, it it depends. It depends on what market, but that is that is quite typical. That is a. That is quite typical. And I would say, I mean, when when we talk, you know, Bobby was talking about the, the the built form of the building. We don't typically think about real estate as a field like education or healthcare, where there's like a lot of government intervention because, you know, pri it, it is all owned and developed privately. But I think we probably should. I mean, the, the regulatory burden is quite high in, in modern day society, even even outside the United States. The architect isn't really designing the building. The, you know, the, the codes are designing the building. So this this mm. form is sort of set from the start. So there's not a ton of flexibility from the architect. In a lot of cities, they put out these little diagrams of how the building should look, and it, it, it's it's very, very close to how it actually works. And the architect can do the finishes. They can do the interior layout of the building. But the fundamental form that is pushing you, you know, Bobby mentioned a 700-square-foot one-bedroom. I mean, that's a concept that just doesn't exist in other countries. In other countries, a 700-square-foot apartment would be a two-bedroom mm. apartment. And it's not just because, 
you know, our bedrooms are a little wider. They're a little wider. It's not just because we have a lot of more closets. We do have more, a lot more closets. It's because that's really the only way that you can design the building if you want a window in the bedroom, at least. That that's exactly right. Right. So once the building, once the unit is thirty feet deep, having a window in the bedroom means the unit is going to need at least be like 23, 24 feet wide. Right. So then basic geometry just tells you how how your different units step up in size uh, as you add bedrooms. Just to play devil's advocate, and I know Joe says he doesn't like the suburbs, but setting Joe <laughs> aside, what evidence do we have that families, you know, assuming that there there were good sized apartments designed for families, what evidence do we have that families would want to mm. stay in that kind of presumably more urban environment? Are there other factors at play where maybe people want to buy a house and build up equity? Maybe they want different schools. Maybe they want a garden for their kids to play in. What evidence do we have yeah. that families actually want this? Yeah. Just to add on to that, and I agree with, I, I, you know, even though Tracy started as a devil's advocate question, I do wonder, like, do people go to the suburbs because the houses are there? Yeah. Or do they go to this, you know, or do they go to the suburbs because they want the suburban life? I mean, the 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 rent shows you that there's the demand for it. The rent and the prices, you know, you, like a, a typical, you know, family family uh, housing unit in New York might be a townhouse, and I mean, the the, the prices are extraordinary. So, you know, I, I would say the dem- the 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 evidence that the demand is there is the very low vacancy rate in our cities, and the high price. And you know, you look at other countries that simply allow this kind of family. So this, you know, family oriented apartments and you, you have a lot more of a culture of families, you know, living downtown. Just on that note, can you give us some examples of how other countries handle this? Mm. Because I often think with the U.S. housing market, it's really helpful to look at how other places do it because there's often such a big contrast. Yeah. So the, the design of an Ameri- a North American apartment building is very globally unique and it is what in other countries they might think of as a hotel. So you enter the building. um, You might remember it from the movie The Shining. There's a big long (laughs) hallway, uh, and there's you know there's there's apartments. Great description of American apartments. It's like The Shining. Yeah, and I mean they 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 all look like this, and maybe the hallway will twist and turn a little, but it's going to be a long hallway. There's going to be units arrayed to the left, arrayed to the right. On the end of the building, there might be some you know three bedroom sort of reasonably sized apartments because they're on the corner. In the rest of the world, let's use Europe because the people have a lot of familiarity with it. Typically, there will not be as much of this hallway space, if at all. So typically what it'll be is it'll be, you'll enter the building, there'll be a single staircase. Mm. They'll, you know, if there's an elevator, it'll probably be a little smaller. It'll definitely be a little smaller. And it'll go, you know, you'll so you'll have this vertical core of the staircase and the elevator. And then arrayed off of it, there will be likely between one and four, but probably two apartments on either side, left and right. So each building, or at least little core of a larger building, will, you know, let's say it's a six-story building, pretty typical height. There will be, you know, 12 apartments in the building. There will not, you know, it's not going to be a, you know, 100-unit building. There's not going to be a long hallway. And these units, uh, if if you're American, or if you're familiar with New York, I'm really describing a tenement. So, you know, the, these units, they'll go from the front of the building to the back of the building. The In the rest of the world, the building will typically be maybe 45 feet deep, and the apartment will go from front to back. So in general, there will be a much higher ratio of surface area to volume, which is to say you're going to have more windows. So in 700 square feet, you're going to have two bedrooms. In 900 square feet, you're going to have three bedrooms. Whereas in the U.S., those are one and two bedroom apartments. In the rest of the world, you're much more likely to have windows in the kitchen, windows in the bathroom. You just have more windows generally and much more flexibility with laying out the laying out the plan. It's funny because if someone asked me what the difference is between a European and apartment build and a U.S. apartment building is like, I don't know if, what I would have said. But then the moment you said like, oh, those tiny elevators <laughs> and that single central core staircase, I was like, oh, yeah. And I haven't spent that much tra- time traveling in Europe, but I like immediately got that as like random Airbnbs yeah, I've like, stayed in in like Italy or Paris. It's, or it's, it's not just Europe. It's every, you know, from, you know, Dhaka to Switzerland, you know, from Bangladesh right. to Switzerland. They, 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 this is... This is how an apartment building is built. And this was how an apartment building was built in America, too. If you think about like a Chicago three flat or a New York City tenement or, you know, one of those uh, little uh, two story, four unit buildings in Los Angeles, this is how apartment buildings by humans are designed. It's just in North America. We've 
taken it a different direction. Well, can I ask, why has that happened? Uh, it's a combination of, I would say, two things. It's a combination of our very, very unique approach to fire safety rules, which are in turn driven by our obsession with uh, building buildings out of light wood frame. And then it's also, I would say, our obsession with the way our society looks down on apartments and confines them to very small pieces of the city. So let's take the second one first. To have a an apartment that has a lot of windows, you tend to need a little bit more land. And in America, you know, we have these competing, you know, planners have these competing mandates. On the one hand, there's clearly a housing crisis. And, you know, especially in our cities, we need to allow more apartments. On the other hand, you know, the local politics are such that nobody wants to live near an apartment. Nobody wants it near them. So we confine them to these, you know, loud, polluted arterial streets. So if you think mm -hmm. about a new apartment building, it's probably not being built on a leafy side street with a lot of land. So, all, you know, most of our land is locked up in single family houses and it would be pretty trivial to demolish them and build something new, but that's not really allowed. So in this attempt to try to fit so many apartments on such a small piece of land, uh, the buildings just get like really thick, really deep. And this is a good way of cramming in a lot of square footage. It's not a great way of cramming in a lot of bedrooms. Then on the other side of things, the United States has a very unique approach to construction. Something that foreigners are very surprised about when they watch American TV series is <laughs> you punch through the wall and I mean- Yeah. Drywall. You, yeah, you punch through the wall and there's nothing there. It's, it's yeah. built out of wood and drywall. So we've traditionally allowed people to build out of light wood frame. Whereas in the rest of the world, again, from Bangladesh to Switzerland, you build the building out of concrete. Mm. So as a result, the buildings traditionally have been quite flammable. America has a very high rate of fire deaths. You're much more likely in America than in any other advanced country in a lot of far less advanced countries to die in a building fire than in other countries. So we have all these mitigations. One of the mitigations, probably the most important one in driving apartment design, is two interior staircases. There has to be two ways to get out of the building by staircase. This is very unique globally. In other countries, this is really reserved for skyscrapers. So if you need two entrances, and since 9-11, in most of the country, except ironically New York, they have to be, the term is remote from each other, they have to be uh, at a distance. So if every apartment needs to get out two ways and they need to be a distance from each other, well, the most logical thing to do is have this long hall, hotel like corridor in the, in the middle. So that is the simple version of what's driving all of this. So Bobby, as a developer and as a floor plan expert, floor plan knower, you know, how much does that resonate? And when you're thinking about a new building, how much do you feel constrained ultimately in design by some of the rules that Stephen's been talking about? Oh, completely. But I would say, like in sports, the way that I sort of approach it is yeah. these are the strictures. Like, I want to try and make things as good as possible within within the bounds of that, within the bounds of those limitations. So Stephen's absolutely right that those are um, the design limitations I'd say that there were some other ones, too, that have to do with capital. It is much more efficient uh, to build a 250-unit apartment building, double-loaded very quickly, and inexpensively out of wood. And that is one thing that, uh, especially across the United States, um, we have done very well, very, very, very quickly in Texas, in, uh, in the suburbs. And those projects are the ones that institutional investors want to put their money in. They're tip a, a large developer is typically not going to waste their time doing any project that's under 200, 250 apartments, both from the equity side and just, uh, it is just as complicated to build 10 as it is to build 250. So I think you mentioned before we started recording this, but that you yourself are investing in more projects that are explicitly designed for families. How is that process like? How is it in terms of identifying those projects? How common is it that they're being proposed? And then secondly, what are the different calculations that you would make for a family-oriented project versus mm. something, you know, I, I guess uh, more normal for an apartment building? Well, I think about it from a product perspective, which is another area where I, I believe that real estate is lacking. Uh, the product philosophy for most apartments, certainly in the United States, is to offend as few people as possible. That's why <laughs> uh, there's three different color palettes of 
cabinet colors. Gray, gray, and gray. That's exactly right, right? Everyone uses the same LVT I've seen flooring. I've white. Right. <laughs> the, uh-huh. right. There's, there's, uh, so that's, that's a problem in general. So I, I would say the way that I start by approaching it is saying, I want to build something that is a product that will actually delight families, which to me means it's going to need to be a smaller project. A, a 250 unit project with kids would be unpleasant for everybody. And I'd also say that I think there's a lot of diversity within family and family oriented, which is why I sort of use that phrase. I think that I think that it needs to be a product that is appealing to someone who doesn't not just people who have kids. If there was a problem that I another problem that I'd say within um US apartments is that it's fairly monolithic in turn who goes after, right? Like I like billiards rooms, but every building has Every rooming has a billiards room. Like everyone has like a rock climbing wall here in New York. They all have these, they all fit these same things. So what I want to do is build something different. How does that different differentiate from a typical building? It's going to be smaller. It's going to be about 60 to 100 units. That is uh, good for me and that I am not competing with say the Trammel Crow and Avalon Bays of the world who would eat my lunch operationally. And the difference in the type, again, fitting within the double loaded corridor means one of the metrics that I track uh, in floor plans is something that's called like bedroom ratio, which is the amount of square footage that is behind bedroom doors. And the other one is the ratio of the size of bedroom one to bedroom two or bedroom one to bedroom three. Ah. So for a family, the main thing that I look at is reducing the size of those second and third bedrooms. Yeah, right. Because if it's like two roommates, then presumably they want like mm. the same size. Exactly. Whereas like, if well, it's kids. if it's kids, they can have a small. They don't need a master bedroom, and they and they don't need an ensuite bath. Yeah, uh, it, that might be nice, but th- when when you're talking about like uh, an urban or uh, expensive suburban markets, space is at a premium, and so it's all about right. making the best change you can. So this might be one for for either Bobby or Stephen, but it, you know, Stephen talked a little bit about the regulations in the U.S. and how that impacts building design, specifically around fire safety. Are there additional regulations that kick in if you know you're going to be having small children oh, living in question. a space? And the reason I ask that is because I know in New York, if if you live in an apartment, every once in a while you get a, a form from the city asking you to fill it out. If you have small children in that apartment, they need to put like bars on the windows so they don't fall out and other safety <laughs> measures. Is that a consideration or a thing that comes into play? Generally not with a new construction. Okay. So there are regulations for uh, children around things like lead. Uh, for older buildings, uh, owners have to continually certify and have to have a, a higher level of certification if there are people under a certain age living there. But for new construction, uh, those safety things, are I'm not aware of any building regulations or construction regulations that are different for uh, who occupies it. In fact, regulations like the FHA require that anyone be allowed to rent any unit mm. um, that is there. Now, design will practically discriminate, right? Like if you were to design you know, a 375 square foot studio, a family, I suppose, could rent it, but they're not going to. Right. Yeah. And I mean, even for these big apartments, I mean, the reason they don't build them is if they did build them, you couldn't afford it. So yes. like, Joe, you know, you're looking right. for a bigger apartment. Well, I'm sure you're seeing them. They're just out of your price range. Yeah. That's what we see is like, okay, there'll be the one bedroom, the studio, the one bedroom, maybe the two bedroom. And if you, you know, I don't even need three bedrooms. I just need two. But if you like go to that next level, then it balloons. So like the units do theoretically exist. They're just like so much more expensive. Well, you know, again, this gets to some of these questions about do families like really want to live in cities, et cetera. But if there was one sort of like policy change or prescription that could really improve the family orientedness of the new housing stock in New York, what would it be? Uh, I'm going to cheat and give you two. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, um, well, actually, in New York, I can just give you one. Uh, th- we need to zone more land for apartments. And I think when people think of land, they think of big cornfields. But most urban land is tied up in single family houses. So, you know, single family, you know, I- including in New York City. So, you know, we think about New York City as, you know, Brownstone, Brooklyn and Manhattan. But, you know, the truth is a lot of New York is Staten Island, outer Queens, yeah. outer, outer Brooklyn. So more of that land, more of those lots need to be zoned for, you know, low and mid-rise apartments. And then some things that need to be changed a little in New York and a lot in other uh, cities is we need to 
change our building code so that you can build a building with a single staircase. In so, New York, you can. In other places, you can. So maybe make the construction material more resistant to fire, and then if you do that, you can achieve similar outcomes with fewer yeah, you, points of egress. You, you could do that, although you know, a, a, a generation or so ago, the United States started requiring sprinklers in all buildings, which is globally extremely unique. You won't find a sprinkler outside of a high-rise skyscraper hmm. in uh, Switzerland. So, you know, it, it, at least in theory, and I, I think in practice, uh, a sprinkler should provide the same hmm. fire protection that, you know, just building the whole thing out of concrete does. So I think, frankly, the buildings are already, I mean, the, the real fire traps in America are the single-family homes. You can still build a single-family home pretty much everywhere out of light wood frame. And in most places, especially the places that actually build them, without a sprinkler system. So in, in America, we, you know, we, we, we treat uh, apartments as these, you know, dangerous things and, you know, single family houses is, you know, this, uh, you know, just a, a right and normal thing. Uh, but the truth is our single family houses are quite dangerous. So I think if we if we applied similar standards, either brought the standards of the single family homes up or I wouldn't do this, but, you know, bring the, the standards of the apartments down, then I think it would make a lot more sense to build uh, apartments. Hmm. Like right now, it makes a lot more sense for families to live in single family houses, partly because they're, you know, they're built as fire traps. So they're a lot cheaper. <laughs> Bobby, what would you like to see uh, when it comes to maybe encouraging more family-oriented uh, mm. apartments in the U.S.? I think developers have the tools to do it currently. It, it is going to require creative partnerships with the, right ten, with the right kind of capital. Short-term private equity is going to be a lot more difficult in financing these kinds of projects, but they they work. They pencil. Mainly it requires, I'd say, developers being willing to do the chicken and the egg. I fundamentally believe that families well, do want to live in cities. Sure. Taking this sort of like product-oriented approach to thinking about real estate and demand for like normal consumer goods, like it goes through fads and changes all the time. Is there, do you perceive a fundamental change in demand? Are there more families like mine that want to stay in the urban core? And is this something that's different in the year 2023 than might have been in the year, say, 1993? It's not something that I can show yet. It's only something I can know mm. as being someone who's lived in the city and knowing the number of people who are meeting people in the city, falling in love with the city, like they have kids here. Yeah. They move after those things occur. So I, I would say at the moment, the option isn't there for them to stay. So, I mean, I believe and I'm willing to bet on, and I think other developers should too, that that will work. People in the United States are delaying having families or having, they are having fewer kids, but they, most people still eventually make that decision. And that product is not being built at all, which to me is, even just as an investor, is a compelling thesis. If even just a small percentage of people stay, then at the moment, they have no new choices. Bobby and Steven, I feel like we could get, there's so many sort of branches of this conversation that we could take. Super fascinating. I'd love to have you both back on sometime. Got to leave it there. But seriously, like there's so many interesting like aspects of the uh, housing conversation. We could take this. So appreciate you both coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, that was great, guys. Thank yeah. you so much. So, Tracy, I mean, it, I know you really want me to move to the suburbs so that you can have more space in New York, et cetera, but maybe there's an option. Maybe it could happen that we could both stay here. I just want more dog amenities yeah, that's what I'm in saying. apartment buildings. Maybe we could have both. No, you mentioned branches from that episode. And one thing that, that has always sort of confused me is why in the U.S. the standard like building material is that yeah. like that really thin like yeah. wood framing. I've yeah. never understood that. And sometimes when you see, especially single family houses going up to Stephen's point and you see the framing for those, it really looks like nothing. And it does look like they could A, either go up in flames very quickly or B, just fall over with like one good gust of wind. Yeah. You know, another aspect of this that we didn't get into, it's just like, you know, 
home ownership culture versus mm-hmm. rental culture and whether there is a perception that you don't need to build as well for rental. Maybe the problem is really just like, you know, capitalism and this need for everyone to own a home or the distortionary impacts of uh, this idea that everyone needs to own a home. Yeah, there's yeah. that. But to me, the the big like, yeah. the thing that resonates is this idea that choice of building materials yeah. leads to the need for additional regulation, which ne- leads to design choices that yeah. are not necessarily optimal. Well, and then, you know, you know, I don't know. I think we talked about this and I haven't found it. There's like this famous like post that someone put on medium about why like all cars look this the same Uh, yeah and i think it's just because they all have to design for the same safety and fuel standards regs and so there really is like sort of one optimal design and it kind of sounds like you know to some extent that's the same thing that's happened with homes which is that if mainly you're sort of like feeling like you're optimizing for one sort of set mm-hmm. of regulations, then you do just get these endless gray buildings. And then the only places where you can exercise some creativity is in the rock climbing wall. And I want that too. <laughs> I want to, you know, I also want a rock climbing wall. I'm not against these things. How regulation ruined design. That's a, that's a yeah. good topic. Okay. Shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow our guest, Bobby Fion. He's at Bobby Fion. Steven tweets under the handle at Market Urbanism. Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Armin and Dash Bennett at Dashbot and check out all of our podcasts at Bloomberg under the handle at podcasts. And for more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots. We have blog posts, transcripts, and a newsletter that comes out every Friday. Go there and sign up. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.